Well, good morning, church. Happy Byron, Sabbath. Morning. Happy Sabbath. Byron, Mark, and I are just delighted to be with you this morning. And we want to wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We're really pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Now, you're probably wondering, where are we? <laughs> now, I can tell you that we are where we usually are. Yeah, exactly. Definitely in, not the, in the Grand, church. Not the Grand Canyon. <laughs> it's it's, it's a, by the Grand Canyon and so on. Well, yeah. yeah, we're having a lot of fun. Uh, we've had a lot of fun this week, and we'll continue to have some fun this week yep. with the uh, uh, VBS in our, in, in our church. And I can tell you what, when I came into church today, I was just delighted. <laughs> exactly. Delighted that I could have behind us an incredible view of what it is like to worship God and our children are enjoying just that. Amen. So, um, Mark, as, um, as we prepare, our, uh, prepare to really explain this lesson and talk about it, will you pray for God's blessing on hey, this sure, morning's study? Sure, Victor. Yeah. Dear Lord, um, we come to you and we thank you for the blessings you've given us. And given us this opportunity, we can come to you together with you. Help, help us to learn about your path, your journeys for us, and when those journeys sometimes take a tough turn. Uh, we're going to learn about that and dig into that today, and we ask that you be among us, you help us to decipher and learn from you so that we can tell others about your wonderful word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Mark. Well, this week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, The Bird Cage. And when I read that word, the bird cage, I said, I've got to get in it. You know, you, know, you know that that probably is literally what happens to each one of us. Amen. That Lord, the Lord sometimes let us be in the cage so that we can actually sing the song that He wants us to sing. And literally in the darkness. In the dark. In the darkness. And, yep. and that is amazing. So, the memory verse. The, uh, the key text this, this morning uh, for this lesson is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. And it says, in this you greatly rejoice. Mm. And then it says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Ooh, this is powerful. Now, knowing that Wednesday's lesson is based on 1 Peter 1, and that Byron is going to talk about it, I'm not going to provide any commentary whatsoever. So it's up to you, Byron. <laughs> All right. Back that. But on Wednesday, if you feel free or feel the need, jump okay. in. All right. Okay, sounds good, Byron. <laughs> Here's a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. If you recall, last week we studied a few types of crucibles. We looked at crucibles of Satan, sin, purification, and maturity. This week's lesson focused more on crucibles of maturity. While it is true that many of our troubles are created by us, by you and me, by ourselves, God is ultimately the sovereign. He is the supreme ruler of the entire universe, of the history of nations, as well as of our individual lives, your life and my life. God not only wants us to grow as, individual, uh, as individuals, but also as families, as communities, and as nations. In the context of our fallen nature, our sinful nature, growth, and that's what God wants from us, growth, takes on additional dimensions. You see, we know that God saves us by His grace. We also know that He justifies us by the substitu uh, substitutional sacrifice of Jesus Christ and by our acceptance of that sacrifice by faith. But God's grace is not a cheap fix. It does not stop at the declarative level. God's grace is educational and it is transformative. Life and salvation are not theoretical experiences. If you don't know that, please check it again. Uh, your life and my life and salvation are not theoretical experiences. We only grow 
when we actually experience God's unconditional love for us. We only grow when we commit to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. We only grow when we commit to live with God and permit God to live in us. Because both God and us are involved in a cosmic conflict. We must commit to take God's side and to promote His kingdom in response to His commitment to rescue us from the kingdom of sin and from Satan. This way, when we so do, God becomes the Lord of hosts, the, the one leading us to grow, the one that sees to the transformation of my character and your character. Ellen G. White in Ministries of Healing, pages 472, makes the following observation. And, here, and here's really where the birdcage comes in. She says, pages 472 of Ministry of Healing, In the full light of day, and in hearing of the music of other voices, the caged bird will not sing the song that his master seeks to teach him. He learns a snatch of this, a trill of that, but never a separate and entire melody. But the master covers the gauge and places it where the bird will listen to the one song the master is to sing, that he is to sing, and in the dark, it tries and tries again to sing that song until it is learned, and he breaks forth in per perfect melody. Ellen White goes on to say, Then the bird is brought forth, and he ever after, he can sing that song in the light. This way, God deals with his children. He has a song to teach us. And when we have learned it amid the shadows of affliction, in other words, the darkness, we can sing it ever afterward. Powerful words. And how truth this is. Notice, notice that it is the master himself who carries the bird into the darkness. It is easy to understand that Satan causes pain. But would God himself actively take a part in guiding us into crucibles where we experience confusion and hurt? And that's a big question for this week's lesson. And you'll probably hear that throughout the lesson. This week's lesson highlights two themes. The first of these themes is that God leads us through the struggle of this fallen world. Thus, we should be comforted by the knowledge that God leads us. This should also give us strength and confidence in God because He's leading us. The second theme helps us understand that it is only when God leads us through the battles of our life that we grow and are, and are transformed. So what are the themes for this, for, for this week's lesson? God leads us through the struggles of this fallen world. And it is only when God leads us through the battles of our life that we grow and we are transformed. Byron, Israel made their way to the promised land via a dead end. Exactly. <clears throat> what is the lesson telling us? What lesson is there for us? Not only a dead end, Victor, a God-guided dead end. Dead end, exactly right. I know, it makes you wonder what God was doing to them. <clears throat> so... We start off, we want to read the memory verse. Well, first of all, it is the promised land is the dead end, and we're going to see just how they got there. Exodus 13, verses 17 through 18. Now, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war, see war and return to Egypt. Hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. I like that. So they're almost yep. marching in, in military style. Absolutely. So 
How, let me ask you, from the land of Goshen to Jerusalem, how far do you think that is? If you took the most direct path? Hmm. About 200 miles. Probably. If you get to the border of Israel, the, the Gaza Strip, about 100 miles. So even if they were doing 10 miles a day, within three weeks, they would be in the promised land. God had different plans for them though. Three weeks would be far too short a time for them to unlearn what they had learned in Egypt. We're gonna take a look at um, Exodus 13, chapter 13, verse 21. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day and to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So we see Israel, we see they've seen the wonders of God, they've seen the plagues from the Exodus and they've seen at the final plague with the death of the firstborn and the angel of death and they see how literally God could do such miraculous things and they are free from Egypt. So they're following the cloud, blindly trusting God wherever they go. So what do you think God is trying to do with them with all of this going on? I wanna read something from Ellen White Education, chapter 30, page 253. Faith is trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good. Thus, instead of our own, it leads us to choose his way. In place of our ignorance, it accepts his wisdom. In place of our weakness, his strength. In place of our sinfulness, his righteousness. Our lives, ourselves, are already his. Faith acknowledges his ownership and accepts its blessing. Truth, uprightness, purity have been pointed out as secrets of life's success. It is faith that puts us in possession of these principles. So, did Israel have this? They'd seen the wonders of God, but did they possess this faith? And we're gonna see later even when they're at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, when they say everything that God says we will do, was it by their own righteousness or by the righteousness that they imputed from God? So we're gonna see God has a terrible, terrible lesson to put in front of Israel here. They, they need to be scared straight. And so the pillar leads them down a corridor of mountains. You have mountains to the left, you have the Red Sea to the right, and you have a dead end. It's kind of like being stuck in a tube. The only way you can get out of it is to back out. And what do they see coming at them from the other side? The Egyptian army. And it strikes fear in them, terrible fear. And we read in Exodus thir- or chapter 14, verses 13 through 15. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. For them to go forward into the Red Sea, what did that require? That step of faith. All of the things that God was trying to build in them that we just read. So we see this, and we see God take care of them because the moment they went forward, who had their back? The Lord did. The Bible says that the pillar of cloud went between them and the Egyptian army so that we know God had their back while they were stepping out in faith and trusting him. So we know that the Lord is fighting for them. We know that they are being transformed, and yet how many times do you still hear, oh, if we had better, it would have been better if we would have died in Egypt, right? 
Did this generation ever learn? No, they never entered the promised land. They never enter the promised land. Try it as God may, they still would never learn. I want to actually look at something in Exodus 15, verses 6 through 8. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And in the righteousness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them as chaff. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. The deep, or the deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. And we know this is part of the Song of Moses. But it looks like Israel believes they will never have any more trials after this. Yep. They believe that, oh, this was great. I have smooth sailing now, and, and this will all in the past. It's going to be easy cruising to the promised land. But what is the reality of this? Do the problems, do the crucibles ever disappear? No. You might get breaks Not here and there, but on this earth, who has a character like Christ? Perfect. No one. That's why. And until you do, the crucibles will never cease. That's correct. So I want to ask you a question. Is there any times when God will lead you to a place, I don't want to say deceptively, but almost misleading you where you're going for your own good? With the Red Sea, he did that there. He led them to a dead end. Right. And they thought he would protect them. I want to ask you, is there a time in recent history where perhaps people were not, by prayer and supplication, led to the most, how should I put it, clair, clairvoyant journey? And I'm thinking of the great disappointment. It was with earnest prayer that they sought, and they thought that the Lord was coming, the second coming. William Miller was convicted by God to give the message. Yep. The advent is coming, and then the day happens, and what happens? Not the great disappointment. Right. Yet, what was the accomplishment of that? It was God separating the wheat from the chaff. Yep. That's exactly right. And in doing so, His will was done. And it, we should expect no less in our lives. Because if you are following God, if you are trying to reach that heavenly Canaan, you will always have the enemy trying to block you, and you will always have God trying to bring you that much closer to His character. Amen. All right. Thanks so much, Byron. Um, that certainly is an, an incredible understanding that until I know God and know of God, my faith and my trust and my belief is often not enough mm -hmm. to carry me through. Amen. That's, Amen. Just, yeah. that's just incredible. Mark. In the desert, Israel was uh, led to Rafidin and uh, faced bitter waters. Amen. Yep. What did they learn from this experience? I think they learned a lot. Well, God was teaching. God was teaching a lot. You know, I think the idea here is that, you know, and as Byron pointed out and, and Victor pointed out, you know, God's path for us is not always roses. Right. Okay. And this path has tests. This path has training. But the one thing we're going to learn, and we're going to dig into this idea, and we're going to learn about these bitter waters, is that it's so important that we continue to communicate with the Lord. Okay? The children of Israel were not getting what they wanted. Okay? They, they were getting what they needed. They had just escaped from the Red Sea and this dead end. Okay? But guess what? They were still in a desert. That's exactly and right. when you're in a desert, uh, I, often you need water. So in Exodus 17, verses 1, we, we, we read about this. Then the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. 
Now, honestly, I'll see that the children of Israel were quite bold <laughs> complaining to, to, uh, to Moses. And we've heard that. You mentioned that about that, <laughs> Byron. This, we often look at them as if, oh, those, those guys. But if you were in the desert for three days without water, oh, yeah. I think we might be grumbling. Too, right? <laughs> well, that's a good point. You know, God had recently brought out of Egypt. They were escaped from the army. You would think that they would look back. You could say that, yeah, you could say that they could look back and go, this miracle happened to us. Yeah. But on the other hand, they're thirsty. How there's, often? There's sun, there's, they're in the desert. You know? How often do we do the, what have you done for me lately? Mm-hmm. And I was, actually, I wrote, how often do we rem- look back and we, we've right. been complaining, yep. but then a little while longer, you look back and realize that God has been with you all, all along. along. All along. Absolutely right. But, I, right. but I'd say, you know, were they justified to complain? And I think Byron points out, maybe. You know, if I was there, would, would you be scared? Well, I don't know if we were justified. I'm just saying we'd be right along there with them sinning. <laughs> exactly. I think maybe I'd be scared too. But let's read about, we're going to jump back to chapter 15 in Exodus and read more about this idea of bitter waters. Okay, and this is chapter 15, verses 22 and 24. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, and they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Byron, I mean, Victor and I were talking before, the last thing we were saying, you know, and Victor was saying, you know, God took them to the bitter waters, exactly right? Right? And, and, you know, maybe so. What can, and the people, have, uh, people complain and say, what should we drink? Have you ever been on a path, God's path, where you've been stumped, where the going gets rough? And I think the idea here is that's, what they're, that's what's happening here, and we're seeing it a couple times. And in Exodus 15, verses 25, let's read on and see what God does. So he cried out to the Lord, and this is Moses, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he cast it into the waters. The waters were made sweet. And there he made a statue and an, abu- an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Now, one thing I want to point out is that during this time, I mean, they, they're stumped. And they had chosen Moses to be that intercessor between themselves and God. And what did Moses do here? He cried out to the Lord. When we're on our journeys, when we get stuck, we need to cry. And we can follow Moses' example and cry out to the Lord. The Lord will listen. And, and did he listen? He listened. He's always listening. The other thing that he did here is that if you read the second part of uh, Exodus 15, verses 25, it says, and there he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. This idea of testing. This idea of train, and, and actually, uh, it, it, it reads in the Bible, some commentary is saying that this, is, this Hebrew verb is also means training. That's exactly right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's the same, testing, same training. Yeah. And we see here that, you know, God was maybe training right. the, to train the Israelites. Which, and, which go ahead. really means, Mark, that when you are being tested, God expects you to learn. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And often, exactly. Often that does not happen. Yeah, that's true. Right. Plain. <laughs> and, and we actually see in Exodus uh, 14, verses 18, wasn't he also training the Egyptians? Yep. Um, if you read there, he says, then the Egyptian, and he said, this is the, when we, this Red Sea departing, the Red Sea coming open and allowing the, uh, Israel's, Israel, the, the children of Israel to escape. He says, then the Egyptian shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself of a Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. But let's also read on and see specifically in Exodus, what was he training them to see in this case? This is this ordinance that he says. And he said, and, and this is Exodus 15, verses 26. And he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sights, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which you have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I see that message, this idea that I am the Lord who heals me. 
Cry out to the Lord. Pray to him. Ask him for it. And he will heal you. Yeah. Exodus, um, it, keep his commandments, keep his statutes, and God will, God will heal you. Exodus 15, verses 27. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. Yep. And they camped there by the waters. Which is a nice place to camp yes, out. I think right. a good place right. to camp right. out. It seems like it anyway. Palm trees, you know, waters. But they were in the desert, and there's going to be other trials. And the desert often has waters, and we've talked about bitter waters here. And we, at the, we started this lesson talking about Exodus 17, verses 1, where the, the children went to, they camped at Rehoban, where there was no water. I'm going to read on Exodus 17, verses 2 through 3. And he said, Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And then Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And, you, and as Byron was mentioning earlier, it's like that, that term, with thirst, well, with hunger, you with <laughs> all, of all of the be above. And so we contend that this path that we are, this path that God had the children of Israel on was a path to help them learn, to help to test them, to train them to trust in the Lord. Yes, they're stubborn, okay? But we can also be stubborn too. And I'm going to read in Exodus 4, uh, chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. And it says, So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. I just wanted to point out, Moses once again goes to the Lord and asks for help. And once again, the Lord is there Correct. listening to him, Correct. giving the children of Israel maybe not exactly what they wanted, but what they needed. Right. The other thing I want to point out, and we're going to learn about this also in Exodus, is that, that the, and we've, we've talked a little bit about the children of Israel, about them not being perfect. And, and um, we see this once again, you know, we're not perfect too. And so on our paths and journeys, and we're, we're going to complain sometimes, and we're not going to be perfect. But you can see in Exodus chapter 17, verse 7, kind of the pretty, let's read this and then we'll talk about it. So he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Yep. The children of Israel were, you know, they're kind of trying to manipulate God a little bit. They wanted it there. They were trying to mm -hmm. get him to do something. Mm -hmm. How many times have we wanted something and didn't get it? And maybe blame mm -hmm. the Lord. And we're, this is a, a lesson for us. They wanted water. They wanted food. They wanted protection when they wanted it. Mm -hmm. You know, even after all the signs that, that, that God is going to be there with them, they were still had doubts. God's path for us may not be easy. Those times are difficult, okay? But they're times of testing. Sometimes it's t the times the, these, these times are going to be difficult. But these are times where we can be tested and training to really trust in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. So, so far, we really have been talking about um, Israel being led into crucibles of maturity, yeah. crucibles of growth. Well, in Tuesday's yeah. lesson, we actually see Jesus going through a journey, a crucible journey. And this is really uh, quite incredible. Um, uh, the lesson on Tuesday is based on uh, Luke chapter 4. It could have been based on Matthew chapter 4 for that matter. But in this particular chapter, and I'm going to, to, to really concentrate on the temptations that Jesus went through while in the desert. Um, in this particular chapter, we see that Jesus is just being baptized, and um, is, uh, he, he comes out of the waters. And guess who's watching Jesus being baptized? Satan. Satan was among the witnesses at Christ's baptism. He saw God's glory. 
encompassing his son Christ. The clouds open, God's glory come up, and he heard the voice of God testify, testifying to the divinity of Jesus. Whoa, that troubled the devil. You see, after Adam's sin, the human race had been cut off from direct communication with God. The interaction between heaven and earth had been maintained through Christ. But now that Jesus had come to the earth clothed in humanity or in the likeness of sinful flesh, as Paul describes it in Romans chapter 8, verses 3, God the Father spoke. And this was a sign to everyone present, including the devil, that the Father would now communicate with humanity in Christ. This challenged the devil. The devil's belief that he was in charge of this world. You see, Satan had hoped that God's abhorrence of evil would bring an, an eternal separation between heaven and earth. But as God testified of the divinity of Jesus, he announced to the world that the connection between God and human beings had been restored. And so we read in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the following. It tells us that then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days by the devil. As we read these two verses, it just appears at first glance that the Holy Spirit is leading Jesus into temptation. This would, of course, contradict what God tells us in James chapter 1, verses 13, where he tells us, Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And I want you to believe that, because that's the truth. Ellen G. White in Desire of Ages pages 126 and, and, and 129, goes on to explain. Often, when placed in a trying situation, we doubt that the Spirit of God has been leading us. But it was the Spirit's leading that brought Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. She makes the statement, when God brings us into trial, he has a purpose to accomplish for our good. She goes on to say, Jesus did not presume on God's promises by going and bidden into temptation. Neither did he give up to, this, to despondency when temptation came upon him. Nor should you, should, should you and I. You see, what Luke chapter 4 tells us is that God does lead us to crucibles of testing. You've heard it from Mark. You've heard it from Byron. He tells us that the Holy Spirit can lead us to times of testing that involves being exposed to Satan's fierce temptations. At times when we feel these temptations so strongly, we may misunderstand and think that we have not been following God correctly. And I don't want you to think that because this may not necessarily be truth. So we know that Satan decides to tempt Jesus. And then verses 3 to 13 of chapter 4 of Luke describes these temptations. And so what was, what was this test? This was a test of obedience. This was a test of loyalty. This was a test of faith. This was a test of belief. This was a test of trust. This was a test of obedience to God's commandment. And whether it is the first or the second or of the third of the temptations described in this particular section, this was a test of one's relationship with God. And in every one of those tests, Christ uh, resolved to go to, to the Bible. And he was... Uh, um, he, he made reference to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, I'm not 
going to read those verses. I want you to read those. But I want to say to you today that what, what this lesson tells us, Christ's temptation and how he overcame, overcame this temptation, what this lesson tells us and tells you and I and, uh, is that from this account, we can derive and learn significant significant ways to deal with the temptations that, that we get every day, that we, we go through every day. I don't have the time to go through a, a lot of these, but are two of these that I want to specifically mention to you today. There are two critical lessons that I want to mention and, and discuss that with you a little bit. The first is obvious. When we read, for instance, um, Luke chapter 4, verses verses 3 and 4, it says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word of God. And Christ here quotes De Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. And by the way, all the other temptations, Jesus quotes Scripture. So Jesus met Satan with the words of Scripture. And this is a lesson for you and for me. When we are tempted, we need to meet Satan with words of Scripture. Jesus used, it is written. He quoted, in every temptation we face, the only successful weapon to use is the Word of God. We need to firmly rely on, thus says the Lord. Christ tells us in Matthew chapter 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, in order for you and for me to actually quote Scripture, we've got to know it. And in order for you and for me to know Scripture, we've got to read it, study it, and memorize as much as we can. And so this is really a little bit of a counsel that I would like to give you. You can overcome temptations with Christ, through the Bible, through His words, and it is important that we get acquainted with that. But the second essential lesson, the essential critical lesson of the temptations that Jesus went through is that Jesus rested upon the wisdom and strength of His heavenly Father. He never used these words. He used the words that were quoted by Him and the Father when Scripture was written. And I think that is something that we need to, 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 to understand. Christ's humanity was united to God's by faith. Christ was fitted for conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When this happened, sin has no dominion over any one of us. Temptations can be so difficult. And why is it? because they appeal to things we really desire, A, and B, they always seem to come at our weakest moments. Jesus gained the victory through submission and faith in God. Christ tells us in James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Sometimes, when we find ourselves in the crucible, we get burned rather than purified. In times like this, it is comforting to know that when we crumple under temptation, we can hope again because Jesus stood firm. So the good news is that because Jesus is our sin bearer and because he paid the penalty for our failure, to, in, to endure the temptations we face daily, and because He went through the crucible worse than any of us will ever face, at Gal Galgatha, at the cross, we are not cast off or forsaken by God. There is hope. There is hope for you and for me. There is hope. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ came into the world to save sinners. And then the Apostle, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul says, of whom I am chief. Byron, an enduring legacy. Thank you, Victor. 
An enduring legacy. What does that mean? Well, let's read a definition, actually, from Merriam-Webster. It said the meaning is lasting, durable, and enduring truth. So let's see just what we're talking about here as far as Christianity goes. First Peter um, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We're going to start off there. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we're going to go to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. My grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. So where is this exactly? This is in what is called modern day Turkey, yep. Western Turkey to be precise. And it literally, you know, Cappadocia, you know it for the fairy chimneys. Yep. You also know it for the underground cities in Galatia and, and Cappadocia. Underground cities that had a special significance later on during persecution times. And um, it, it's beautiful, but historically, it has a kind of a dark side in the past. We hear about Christians in Asia, and we hear about the seven churches, but there is always a struggle for those people in the great controversy. Peter writes in, verse, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, And this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what kind of trials do they face? We can hear about these things, but you know what? Let's look to history. I love it when history records these things. There was a man named Pliny the Younger, and he was the governor for Pontus and Bithynia from 111 AD to 113 AD, and he actually dealt with this Christian problem, as they call it. His letters to Emperor Trajan about the Christian has proved to be an inv like a, literally a treasure trove of historical reference for this. And I want to read this from his letter. Meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. <clears throat> I interrogate these as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserved to be punished. There were others um, possessed of the same folly, but because they were Roman citizens, I signed an order for them to be transferred to Rome. And Paul knows that one. <clears throat> In the same letter, Pliny speaks of two deaconesses who were slaves. They didn't have that Roman citizen privilege. They were tortured, but he states that he found nothing outside of depraved, excessive superstition in them. The letter speaks of how Christians could renounce their faith, offer incense to the emperor, pagan worship essentially, since he was considered a god, and curse Christ, and you could go in good standing again and be one of the citizens, free of any, any persecution. It all comes down to a choice. So we look at this. In Ephesians 6, when speaking about the armor of God, verses 11, 13, and 14 all tell us to stand firm in God. Why is standing firm in God so important in our life? Our walk with God, our surety of his word and his promises, and literally can be a cornerstone of our faith in Christ Jesus. What do we have to look forward to? Well, Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9, this is the reward. And though you have not seen him, that's Jesus, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, 
you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So what could be the consequences of denying Jesus? For those that, that renounced their Christianity and cursed his name, we read Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 36. Because uh, before I say that, there are some people that say this, oh, Jesus knows my heart. I don't have to follow everything, right? I'm okay with him. He knows. I say this, Matthew, Scripture says it. Jesus said it himself. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. So that was true back then, and it will be true in the future as well. So let me ask you, how do you think those Christians in, um, in Pliny's day, back in 111 AD, fared during the persecution? Do you think they stood firm for Christ? Some, or do you think it was overwhelming? I want to read the rest of the letter, the ending. For many persons of every age, every rank, and also of both sexes are and will be endangered for this contagion and this superstition has spread not only to the cities, he's referring to Christianity, but also to the villages and farms. But it seems possible to check and cure it. And then there's your pivoting point. It is certainly quite clear that the temples, and these are the pagan temples, which had been almost deserted, have begun to be frequented that the established religious rites long neglected are being resumed and that from wherever or from everywhere sacrificial animals are coming for which until now very few purchasers could be found. Hence it is easy to imagine what a multitude of people can be reformed if an opportunity for repentance is afforded. In other words, you give them an easier path. It all, and I look at it this way, the multitude of souls, though, that were lost from that, from eternity with Jesus. And when you read the letter, it's everywhere from people who have been Christians for a few years to people who have been Christians for 25 and 35 years who renounced him. All because of the crucibles that broke God's people. Mm. That some it re refined, some it strengthened, some it brought to death. But many were, were, just went with the world. So how will we fare in the days to come? We see times changing now. We see how there's a tilt to worship Sabbath on Sunday instead of the true Sabbaths today. We know the state of the dead, and yet we see a lot of things about souls in heaven and all these things that are strictly not biblical we see that living a comfortable life is an option or enduring, how should I put it, discomfort for Christ. And which will people choose, especially in the end when you can't buy or sell? Right. What will people do? Let us always remember to follow Christ in all that we do and ultimately to surrender all so that in the end we may persevere in him because the only way you're going to persevere is with him dwelling in you. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Uh, Byron. You know, sometimes we forget that even though we need to begin to live as if we were in heaven, the benefit of, of uh, the victory over sin and devil, mm. and the devil will be ultimately being with Christ in, in heaven when we will mm. have no more trials, no yeah. more hurt, yeah. no more pain. Yeah. Mark, explain Thursday's lesson, Trial by Fire. Yeah, I think that Thursday's lesson is about 
you know, it's, it's about really our mission, our mission to um, know Jesus and make him known to others. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is how do we help someone who really, because of his crucibles, because of some trials that he on, his, he's currently on, thinks that God is not enough? Right. And in this, this lesson on Thursday talks about a young man named Alex, and he's going through some tough times. At first, first he's, he wants to follow the Lord, and he has this, this you know, the, he's, he's a believer, and he right. wants to follow him. In fact, it, and he was reading like First John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God, and whoever loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. He wants to follow in God's path that God mm -hmm. has chosen for him. And he has found that he wants to go to school and be a minister. Um, and then he went to school and be a minister. What happens, though, at college is things didn't go very well. Right. Um, his, his source of money started to dry up. A close friend of him turned against him, making accusations that were false, but damaged his reputation. He was getting sick often, and no one knew what was happening about it. And it was so bad that he thought that he might have to leave school because of his illness. On top of that, he was fighting temptations of, with drugs. They were readily available in the local community. Alex, who took it upon himself. He saw this path for the Lord, this path that God has chosen for him. He couldn't understand what's happening. Why am I going through these trials? What is wrong? This experience with God, was this experience with God a huge mistake? Even the most basic of his faith were coming under doubt. So that's the, that's the premise. And so we're, there are plenty of people that are going through trials. We each, all, each are going through trials. What things can we do to help them. In fact, one of the things that we could do is we could, you know, in the secular world, we could say, and I would say this, and I could say this, and say, okay, hang in there. You could be okay. Um, be persistent. And that's, you know, it's okay. Yeah. Be persistent. Or let's analyze this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we could do is that we can reach into this word of God. Exactly. As, as, as Victor was mentioning, we can read into the scriptures yeah. and really show super powerful examples that will help someone like Alex. Right. And let's read a few of these. And I just wanted to kind of bring these up for us. And this is for us so that we can help others. Um, Proverbs 3, um, of course, as King Solomon talks about, Proverbs 3 is all about guidance for the young. And in Proverbs 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Amen. You know, just remembering mercy and truth so that don't let them leave you. Even in these tough, tough times, the tough times that Alex was having. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your, and he shall direct your path. I mean, we've been talking about this today. You know, we don't understand these paths. These paths that, that God has took us on, we don't understand them. Um, we do in a sense that there are opportunities for us to train. There are opportunities for us to be tested, to really, and to, to get, as the birdcage talks about, to get to know Lord even better. And that's what he says. Acknowledge him in all ways. Acknowledge him here. Pray to him so that he can direct your paths. Okay, we're not going to understand what's going on here, but this is one of them. Another place in the Bible is Jeremiah's letter to the captives. And this is in uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 and 2. It says, And now these are the words that the letter of Jeremiah, the prophet, sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And if you read down in verse 4 of this, 29 verse 4, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is God, God taking and on a path that is a, that's tough. It's a tough path. And if, if we go down in Jeremiah 29 verse 13, among other things in this letter, I encourage you to go and read this. It says, 
and you will seek me and find me when you search for me in all, with all your hearts. So those people that are struggling, um, those people that do it, one thing we can do, Jeremiah 13, 29 says, just continue to be looking for the Lord, searching with, with him for your heart, praying to him for the heart. Romans 8, verses 28 says, chapter 8, verses 28, and he and we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. And there's a few more, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is, this is Paul talking about this, you know, saying that, you know, these are opportunities. I and mean, we're going to be tested. We're going to be, if you can recognize it, Paul is actually saying he'd rather boast in his infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And these are just a few of examples that are in the Bible. But the Bible is full of this that encourages us, at least today, when we see people in trials, and, and Victor, I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, we, we have an opportunity for us to bring this word of Scripture of comfort to them. Amen. These are just a few of the examples. There's many more about them. You know, almost all who follow the Lord are going to have crises um, during which they're going to be tempted Amen. to doubt the Lord Amen. leading you know, the important thing is to cling to his promises. Recount God leading in the past, because this is the past. Pray for faith and endurance. Lord, will never give up on us, but don't give in to the temptation to give up on the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. And I really appreciate the fact that you've concentrated in, in an appeal to go to Scripture. Scripture is the strength of my blood flowing, that blood that connects me with God. Amen. That's just the way Amen. it is. Amen. Byron, final thoughts? I think of Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He's there in the good times. He's there in the darkness. And he is there when you feel all alone. Just remember, he never puts you in a temptation or a situation where you don't have a way out. Absolutely Amen. right. He's promised us that, and you should claim that promise, no matter how dark it may be. And yes, we do have to fall on the rock and be shattered and broken. And at times, that's just really ugly. But he's always there. And he only wants to make you ready for heaven. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Byron. Mark, yeah. any final thoughts? Just simply, you know, God has a, a path for each of us. And, you know, it's our part of our spiritual journey with him is to find out what that path is. And this path is not always pretty. It's, it's not always what we want it to be. And there's going to be suffering there, you know, as we talked about. But through that constant relationship with him and faith, God is going to get us through, you know. It may be an opportunity in these tough times to be trained, to be tested. Um, but um, the wonderful thing is, is that by going through that, by sticking with it, by hanging on to those, those promises from the Scriptures, we're going to come out better. Excellent. We're going to come out uh, Amen. Uh, Amen. better for Him. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Byron. In, you know, this has been a, an incredible lesson, incredible lesson for me and for you. And I really hope that through this particular lesson, you, you've understood that you're, you're in a journey. And part of that journey is going to be led by God if you allow it to, do, to be. Yeah, yeah. And it's very possible that in leading you and me to purification and maturity in Christ, that you, we may be going through some crucibles. More than a few. And more than a few. So let's, let's just review a few. Let's review four crucibles of God's discipline into which He personally directed His people. Our Creator God led Israel into the crucible, meandering 40 years in the desert to mature their knowledge and trust in Him. Amen. That was the mm. purpose. God led Jesus into the crucible, 
He was led into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan so that he could minister to you and to me. And later on, he went through the crucible of the cross so that you and I could be saved. God led the early church into the crucible, constant tests and trials to mature the faith of the church. God is looking for genuine faith, but it often comes in the same way as genuine gold, which is made under high pressure with fire, just as in the crucible. And yes, Byron mentioned that uh, early on. God led the Adventist pioneers into the crucible, the great disappointment of 1844, to purify his people's motives. This crucible achieved its purpose. God refined its people to determine who was truly committed. This was a matter of commitment to God, obedience and acceptance. The group became fewer but stronger, and they were ready to accept the next message from God, the three angels' message, which they then eagerly shared with the world today. But what about you and me? And what about today? It is exactly the same. Ellen G. White, in, uh, uh, in uh, a writing to um, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, um, in the April 7, 1903 edition, says the following. But of old, the Lord led his people to Raphidim, and he may choose to lead us there also. That's bitter water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then she says, to test our loyalty. He's testing our loyalty to him. She goes on to say, he does not always bring us to pleasant places. If he did, in our self-sufficiency, we should forget that He is our helper. Then she says, He longs to manifest Himself to us and to reveal the abundant supplies at our disposal. And He permits trial and disappointment to come to us that we may realize our helplessness and learn to call upon Him for aid. Powerful, powerful words. She goes on to say, He can cause cooling streams to flow from the flinty rock. We shall never know until we are face to face with God when we shall see as we are seen and know as we are known how many burdens God borne for us and how many burdens He would have been glad to bear if with childlike faith we had brought them to Him. Powerful words. Don't give up. That's the message yeah. today for Amen. you. Just don't give up. You're facing trying times. That's so that our relationship with Christ and our faith and our trust in Him may mature and grow. Remember, most of the Psalms were conceived, conceived in a wilderness. Remember, most of the New Testament was written in prison. Remember, the greatest words of God's scriptures have all passed through great trials. And remember, the greatest prophets have learned in suffering what they wrote in the books that we currently read and scripture. So take comfort when our God is about to make use of a person. He allows them to go through a crucible of fire so that we can grow and be purified in our trust of God, in our faith for God, in our belief in God, in our courage to move on with God. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I want to invite you to buy your heads, close your eyes as we thank the Lord for His words to, through this lesson and um, the joy that He gives us in knowing that He is with us at every single moment of every day. Heavenly Father, I want to thank You for the assurance of Your presence. Lord, I want to ask that you teach us 
how to hang on, how to hang on to you every day, particularly when we think that things are hard and difficult. Give us that courage. Make us strong. Lord, though we may be tempted to run away from you often when things go wrong, keep us safe. Hold on to us and keep us safe in your hands. Heavenly Father, we just want to be able to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I personally want to thank you for the crucibles of life. Because when you lead us into purification, it is to change our character into a character that is divinely accepted. Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.